Hello and welcome to another edition of the Ask Dr. Pakel Show, where we help people find answers to their chronic health conditions, chronic health problems. And today we've got a very interesting topic. A lot of people have been asking me about this. Um, so I thought, I'd, okay, let's uh, make a video on this. And uh, of course, it's melatonin. What is this stuff? And is it safe? Is it a problem? Should I take it? Um, so that's, these are the questions we're going to answer and what does it do and kind of how does it work in the body? So I think these are these are very important questions to answer and uh, people want to know this uh, this information. So let's dive right into melatonin. OK, so melatonin, interesting stuff, definitely much more than sleep. It does a lot more than help you sleep. Um, you know, when we think of melatonin, we almost automatically think of sleep. Where is melatonin made? Kind of interesting here. The pineal gland, the eyes make melatonin, the skin, the thymus gland, the spleen, your red blood cells, bone marrow, and your intestines. Here's what's interesting, too, is the thymus gland, the spleen, your bone marrow, immune system organs. So, yeah, does it have an effect there? Here's another interesting thing everything living makes melatonin there's there's nothing that's not living that really doesn't make melatonin and here's when we start to have problems is after age 35 once you hit 35 your production of a lot of hormones even melatonin starts to drop because we have to remember melatonin is a hormone it's not a drug it's not a supplement like a typical supplement it is a hormone so again, that degree. Now you could start earlier than this. Some people may start having problems with melatonin. It depends on your health. I mean, if you're a pretty healthy person, you're possibly making melatonin if you're uh, younger than 35. Maybe not. Hard to say. Okay, so here's the interesting thing: the LD50. What what is the LD50 for? And what does LD50 mean? LD50 in science means you're the lethal dose. That means how much of something does it take to kill someone? Not a good thing. So what's the lethal dose for melatonin? There is none. They, in the studies, I'll tell you in a little bit how much they've given some people. Nothing. No negative effects at all. In fact, safer than water. So what the heck? Uh, you know, uh, this stuff must be pretty, pretty safe. No LD50. All right. And then also interesting, this will answer some people's questions. The only hormone that doesn't suppress its own production. So a lot of people, their hang up with melatonin is they say, oh, I'll get addicted to it or I'll take it in my pineal gland or my body will stop making its own like other hormones can cause. But melatonin has never been shown to do that. So very interesting that this cannot really uh, occur here. All right. So here's a few other things interesting about melatonin. So what is melatonin? What's the main ish thing that it, it, we really know it for is our circadian rhythm, our sleep-wake cycle. So when we take melatonin, or not really take melatonin, what is, me I mean, it's already made in our body. It's made mainly in what we talked about a moment ago, the pineal gland. This is in the brain. And when the pineal gland makes melatonin, this actually helps to regulate our sleep-wake cycle. I'm going to talk more about that here in a moment. Another thing melatonin ties into, and I kind of mentioned this briefly a moment ago, immune system. So very important for our immune system in big, big ways. I mean, I'm actually, I'm not going to get into the depths of that, but melatonin has a profound effect on our immune system. Also, antioxidant, pretty darn important to have antioxidants on our body because that slows down the destructive processes, the aging processes of our body. It also can help to decrease pain. Also can act as an anti-inflammatory. It stops multiple types of inflammation, um, not only in the body, the brain, and even in the gut, uh, which is a tough one sometimes to get under control. Also, it can help with the reproduction uh, cycle, basically the timing and release of, um, I would say, especially on the female hormone side, um, but that whole cycle of, um, you know, 
um, ovulation and everything. All right. And then it also can aid in blood sugar regulation. And here's a few other things that are kind of general, but um, there's a lot more specific to these in the research, but these are just general ways of saying it. S the cell cycle regulation, they affect your gene, it affects your genes. Telomerase maintenance. So telomerase, and if you've heard of telomerase, this is um, kind of the little ends of our genes that they're saying, hey, this is how, pre how we predict maybe um, how old a person's going to be able to get, how long they're going to be able to live. So if you have short telomeres, you may not live very long. So melatonin helps to maintain your telomeres and the enzyme telomerase. All right. And then aids in new blood vessel growth and body temperature, because when we're sleeping, our body temperature drops. So melatonin does quite a bit. So let's go to the next page here. So also with melatonin, um, what can it kind of help? What, what do people use it to help with? Well, if you've got sleep issues, not only falling asleep, but staying asleep, melatonin may be a solution. Uh, also, melatonin has much uh, has quite a few uh, research papers on it and it helping with headaches and migraines. Also a big one here in the research, neurodegenerative disorders, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, you know, MS. Yeah. So very, very important there. Also a, a thing we'll have many people come in who are uh, shift workers. Let's say if you work the night shift, we already know from research, that your sleep-wake cycle, your circadian rhythm, gonna be a mess. You you really you aren't getting any sunlight, or if you're getting light, it's usually at the wrong time. So your circadian rhythm really gets kind of reversed. Melatonin can help with that. Also, if you took this long flight to Europe or somewhere else in uh, over the on the other side of the world, and um, you know you get off that plane, and the whole time change difference, that jet lag. So that also can, uh, melatonin can help with that. That's more of a known thing. Uh, also insulin resistance because it, because it can help with blood sugar. Here's an interesting one. There's some research showing melatonin can help with tinnitus. What's tinnitus? That's ringing in the ears. Uh, also radiation detox. So there's many research papers that show how melatonin can be used to get radiation out of the body. Pretty neat especially if you're getting radiation therapy for like cancer. All right. Epilepsy, gastroesophageal reflux disease, sleep apnea. There's actually even more things that it can apply to. I just picked the main ones that were shown uh, in, in research there that are easily found. So how does this melatonin work? What is it? How does it happen here? Okay. So the first thing that happens is light and hopefully it's sunlight, um, hits the retina of the eye. Or when it starts to get dark, dark hits the retina of the eye. Now, most of the day it's light. You know, we're walking around, we're going around. Then maybe it hits now, uh, you know, maybe like 7.30 at night, 8 o'clock. Sun's gone down. It's getting dark. Yeah. Then, I mean, and again, this is more... Uh, if we don't have bright lights on in our house, things like that, but then it starts to get dark, that affects the retina, that sends a nerve signal to this guy here, the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Wow, you don't have to remember that, but what is that? That's like our biological clock. This is an area in our brain that basically is that that sleep-wake cycle clock there. So then once that gets stimulated, that sends this message down to what's called the periventricular nucleus, which is actually in the hypothalamus in the brain. And then that in turn sends a signal down to the superior cervical ganglion. That means it goes down all the way to your neck. Wait a second, could neck problems? cause problems with sleep? Maybe so, but we're not here to talk about that as much, but it is interesting. It goes down to the superior cervical ganglion that's in the upper cervical area of the neck. And then once it gets there, sends a signal up to the pineal gland and says, hey guys, make some melatonin. 
So once the pineal gland gets stimulated, it starts a manufacturing process. Let's talk about this process over here. So first of all, in order to make melatonin, this process starts to occur. We may, or we, uh, we have in our body tryptophan. We hopefully do. Usually we get tryptophan from our diet. It's an essential amino acid, meaning it comes from protein, but we've got to eat it to get it. And then once we have that tryptophan, it gets converted into 5-HTP. Now this is interesting because some people take supplements for 5-HTP. There's also a few things involved that are important in this conversion here of tryptophan to 5-HTP. And then 5-HTP turns into serotonin. So if you already have an issue with serotonin, if you're depressed, if you're on an SSRI drug, if you have um, chronic pain, um, uh, actually quite a few different symptoms uh, that go along with serotonin. In fact, to kind of learn more about this, we have another video on neurotransmitters and serotonin and the actual process that it takes to make serotonin and why there could be problems in this part right here. So do watch that if you get a chance, because it'll tell you all the cofactors, possibly some nutrients that you can use to increase and help producing serotonin. And then once serotonin is made, it's converted into melatonin. And then that goes right back over here. And then this is all a big feedback loop. It just keeps happening over and over until light hits the eye again. So in the morning, the sun is supposed to come up and hit our closed eye within our retina signals, the brain, and we get that. Now, melatonin though, I would say it really peaks um, probably about 2 a.m. And uh, usually it, it should start probably about 7.30, 8 a.m. being released. Now, here's an interesting factor that I wrote down here. Cortisol is an antagonist to melatonin. What does that mean? That means that cortisol, if it rises, melatonin drops. Melatonin rises, cortisol drops. So when is cortisol really usually released? Well, it is released when you have high stress. So if stress level is high, does that disrupt your sleep? Yeah, because you get this high cortisol. What does that do is it decreases melatonin production and affects its production through the night. Now, normally, once we get past about that 2 a.m. time, melatonin, I mean, excuse me, cortisol starts to rise again to push blood sugar to our brain. You know, it varies per person depending on when you, when you have to get up in the morning typically, but your cortisol starts to rise and peak out uh, in the morning. So you can get blood sugar to your brain to help you wake up and pop out of bed. But again, um, cortisol, actually, I think we've got some other videos on cortisol too, but cortisol is an antagonist. So let's talk about um, dosing. Uh, our melatonin, typically, uh, yeah, you want to take it about one to two hours before bed. I mean, even a little later. Some people do better if they take it a half hour before bed. I've had some people take it right when they go to bed and they get the best effect. So you've got to kind of see how your system reacts to it. Um, not only in that, but also in dosage of it. Now, here's an interesting thing from a research paper. Highest dose of melatonin ever given to these people in this study, 18,500 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. That's a lot of melatonin. Did they have any negative effects? No but this was done in a study to do other things. So the thing is, is most supplements that you get, mm, I'd say they're around two to six milligrams and that's fine. Now here's the, here's where the issue comes in. Do I take the pill that you swallow or do I do it sublingually? Well, here's the problem. If you take the pill, number one, pills aren't going to absorb very well. And especially if you have a gut issue, you already are not going to absorb it very well. The other thing too, is not only does gut absorption cut down melatonin um, absorption, but also our gut inflammation cut melatonin absorption, um, or just even just the typical absorption process in a healthy gut, you're still only absorbing a small percentage. And then 
once it gets through your gut, it has to go through the first pass of the liver. So all in all, this decreases whatever you just took by about 90%. That's a big change from what I put in my mouth to by the time it actually got into my bloodstream. So I'm not really recommending that people take melatonin pills. Now, some people will take it and say, yeah, I take the melatonin pills and I feel great. That's because it really only takes a little bit for some people to really notice a difference. And that's okay. If that's all you need, hey, no big deal. But most of my patients have chronic health issues, autoimmune conditions, different health issues, more severe issues. And this is not going to cut it for them. They need a sublingual form. You put a dropper under your tongue, you hold it, let it absorb, and then you can swallow it down. Now that's going to absorb at the highest percentage. It also goes straight into the bloodstream. So we don't have to worry about absorption in the gut or first pass through the liver. Now, some people will say, hey, Dr. Bacall, you know, I took some melatonin and um, I felt lousy the next morning. I felt tired. I felt like this melatonin hangover. What's that about? Well, this is usually uh, two possibilities here. Number one, you got some pretty bad melatonin, meaning there's a lot of melatonin products out there. Some of them are filled with other ingredients. Some of them are just junk. They're contaminated or they're just bad formulations. Those are going to make you feel lousy and cause a melatonin hangover. Some people have a couple of CYP genes, which are liver enzyme genes, genes that make liver enzymes that are having some problems. They have what we call SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, meaning that your liver genetically doesn't make certain enzymes as good as it should, but it could if it were supported more. So sometimes if we find people who have those genetic issues, we can support those genes and this is, doesn't become, this is not a problem at all. But uh, it, as you start to increase melatonin um, and then if you have a gene issue there with the liver, especially if you're taking the pill form, then yeah, you may get this uh, issue here. But um, basically it's, it's rare that people will, if it's a melatonin, and um, uh, a good form, not typically going to be a problem at all. So melatonin, very interesting um, stuff here. Oop, there we go. Very interesting stuff. And, um, you know, I, I'm amazed at um, research on melatonin, how much there actually is, how much it's never really even talked about. Um, and it actually helps in so many areas, even besides the one I've uh, described. And again, based on what we found, we are not seeing negative issues with melatonin. Just like I said in the beginning of the, the, um, the video, a lot of those myths kind of um, go away. So, uh, all right. Well, I hopefully everybody enjoyed today's video on melatonin. And um, oh, let's see here, maybe a few comments here. All right. And then, um, yeah, there's a couple of shout outs here to Sandy and um, to uh, Monica and um, Julie. All right. Well, I hope everybody has a wonderful, wonderful uh, day and God bless. And I'll see you next time.